Hold up. Before we get into this next episode, I want to tell you about our virtual conference that's coming up on February 15th and February 22nd. We did it two Thursdays in a row this year because we wanted to make sure that the maximum amount of people could come for each day since the lineup is just looking absolutely incredible. As you know, we do. Let me name a few of the guests that we've got coming because whew, it is worth talking about. We've got Jason Louie. We've got Shreya Shankar. We've got Dhruv, who is product applied AI at Uber. We've got Cameron Rook Wolf, who's got an incredible podcast and he's director of AI at Rebuy Engine. We've got Lauren Lockridge, who is working at Google, also doing some product stuff. Oh, why is there so many product people here? Funny you should ask that because we've got a whole AI product owners track along with an engineering track. And then as we like to, we've got some hands-on workshops too. Let me just tell you some of these other names just for a moment, you know, because we've got them coming and it is really cool. I haven't named any of the keynotes yet either, by the way. Go and check them out on your own. If you want, just go to home.mlops.community and you'll see. But we've got Tunji, who's the lead researcher on the Deep Speed project at Microsoft. We've got Holden, who is the open source engineer at Netflix. We've got Kai, who's leading the AI platform at Uber. You may have heard of it. It's called Michelangelo. Oh my gosh. We've got Fazan, who's product manager at LinkedIn. Jerry Louie, who created Good old Llama Index. Oh, he's coming. We've got Matt Sharp, friend of the pod. Shreya Rajpal, the creator and CEO of Guardrails. Oh my gosh, the list goes on. There's 70 plus people that will be with us at this conference. So I hope to see you there. And now let's get into this podcast. Hey, I'm Matt. I'm a product manager at Tecton, and I like my coffee black, made with an AeroPress and some fresh hand ground coffee beans. I'm Mike. I'm the chief architect of Tecton, and uh, I usually make my coffee with a in a pour over, um, and I just drink it black. Welcome back to the MLOps Community Podcast. I am your host for the day, Dimitri Ost, and we've got the Tecton team with us here, Mike and Matt. What a conversation. We went through their history, where these guys worked before they jumped into Tecton, and both Mike and Matt have been at Tecton since pretty much the inception. They've been around for four or five years, and... They've been working on a very challenging problem. For those of you that do not know, Tecton is a feature platform and it helps you decouple your code from your feature engineering. It also does a whole lot more. And what I was excited to get into with these guys today was how they have evolved the product over time and also how these days, because of technology advancements, they were able to make the product much more lightweight and not have it be dependent on Spark, which has been, as they noted, something that was a little bit of a hang up in the last couple of years. So because Spark is such a beast, they noticed that not everyone wanted it and they wanted to see, can we go out there and can we build something for those people that don't necessarily need to be doing all kinds of big data. It goes in line with the ethos that we heard from the folks at DuckDB on, and actually we got into DuckDB a little bit because I think under the hood, Tecton is using a few different DuckDB tricks and trades. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Matt and Mike. A huge shout out to Tecton for sponsoring the episode. And if you liked it, you know what to do. Share it with one friend. We'll be seeing you on the other side. I got to call it out, Misim. You put the form that I asked you guys to fill out before this conversation. 
for your job and your bio, it says Michael Eastman is the chief at Tecton. Oh, I missed a word. <laughs> That's actually his official title. Yeah. It was recently announced that he would just be our chief. Chief, and... yeah. Everybody just yeah. calls me chief. Yeah. No, that was uh, I accidentally a word there. <laughs> but it makes for such a better title, man. I'm yeah. expecting you to change that on LinkedIn now. My official title's Big Dog. That's Matt's official title. So we've got Big Dog Matt here. The, <laughs> oh man, uh, product product manager what is your official so your big dog product i guess uh matt and then yeah that's what it says on my uh on my resume i'm a product manager i guess my official title is a group product manager uh there's a group involved these days uh as we've expanded our team a bit so that's been fun and uh yeah been pming at tecton for Almost four years. I got like two months till my four-year anniversary. Pretty excited. Wow. wow. Yeah. That is crazy. Huge. Doc fully vested then, I guess. Yeah. Right? <laughs> four years. Exactly. That's, that's incredible. That's the important metric. So, uh, yes. yeah, four years and almost, I realized I was introducing myself to someone recently. I've almost hit a decade now of just working on ML platforms, which is wild. Might be wow. even cooler than the the four years at, at Tecton thing. So, coming up on that, still uh, in my final year, but it's exciting. Hence, why you get the name Big Dog PM. Yeah, that's how I got it. I know that before you were at Tecton, you did some work at Twitter, right? And this was early days, obviously four years ago. Yeah, similar situation. Just uh, at Twitter, I came in uh, in twenty seventeen. And was hired to be like the first ICPM on their ML platform team. And so was in the early days of like figuring out kind of what is an ML platform in the first place. Um, I have a crazy story to tell about this, actually. So I joined I joined in 2017. Uh, the team ends up going to uh, an offsite in Boulder, Colorado to figure out like what does our ML platform need to look like? How should we kind of orient the teams like we had done some stuff but we were kind of you know really putting a stake in the ground there of like this is what our ml platform org is going to look like mm -hmm. and like the day that we get to boulder um mike del balso our our ceo um and uh jeremy from uber released the meet michelangelo blog post oh and in it they're like oh yeah, we built this thing called a feature store and we're all, you know, we're in like diagram mode on the whiteboard and we're like looking at it and we're like, wait, that's a great idea. We don't have that in here. And so then we like resketch the whole thing. We put a feature store inside of it. We staff a team. It becomes one of my first projects. And so uh, it was kind of crazy then to come full circle from like they, their blog post spawned all the work that I did at Twitter. And then uh, just a few years later, I came and joined them to uh, work on it over at Tecton. So it was uh, quite full circle. I was expecting you to say, and then Elon showed up and... I, <laughs> I was uh, I was gone uh, long before that, although I'm sure that was uh, an interesting thing to watch from the inside, or at least have you know, heard stories from friends and such. But yeah, I left, uh, I left in 2020, so... So long before the Elon phase. Now, are you a user of Twitter? And is there any like sentimental value? Do you feel like he's butchered your feature platform? All that work you did? I like tried to remain kind of neutral or optimistic and see what would happen. I feel like the thing that finally upset me though was the rebrand. Like the the Twitter to X was like, this was a great brand. Like I identified with it. It was like really weird because I was in uh, San Francisco and I was walking down the street and like, you know, there's the famous like Twitter sign going down the corner of the building and it's just blank. And I think that one kind of hit hard. I was like, you know, I don't mind you. Uh, I don't mind you like changing things up, tweaking the product, all that stuff. But like the name had to go. That one, that one hurt me uh, emotionally. Oh, classic. All right. So back <laughs> to the chief. I got to ask you a few questions here. You've been 
in the software engineering game. So basically Matt comes to you with all kinds of requirements or you get, you guys probably uh, liaison quite a bit with what you're building and how you're building it. And before Tekton, you were at Google, right? Correct me if I'm wrong there, Misim. Yeah, that's right. I was at Google for about seven years before I came here. Wow. Wow. Seven years there. It's also incredible. Working on web search, right? Yeah. It started out um, on the indexing team. And so was working on a project there where we were uh, trying to do kind of like what a web browser does when it's rendering a document, like getting layout and things like that so that we could uh, extract signals from it. Um, spent about half my time on that and then moved, um, onto the web server team where I was working on a few different things, but like experiments was one of the big ones. And now you are at Tekton. You've been there for quite a bit too. You're coming up on five years in a couple months. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. How's your role changed over the last five years? What have you been working on? Like what's the journey been there? Yeah. Um, well, so my actual title now is chief architect. It's not just chief. Um, so more of a <laughs> um, kind of like organizational focus, trying to figure out, you know, what direction we should kind of evolve the architecture of the product in um, and, you know, trying to kind of harmonize the work between the uh, different engineering teams that we have now. Um, but yeah, when I started, I was like the first engineer here. So the work was quite different, just was, you know, trying to get something out the door, uh, up and running, uh, so we could, uh, you know, try it out with customers. Um, but yeah, it's been a pretty fun journey so far. So now you're thinking more about the bigger picture and I imagine things have gotten much more complex and you've been there since the beginning. So you've seen it, you have a lot of context and as the complexity grows, you're like one of the key points where people, you're one of those people that understand how things work i would imagine yeah uh <laughs> that's the idea anyway. you could say that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but yeah trying to kind of you know i feel like we've done a lot of you know as we've expanded into you know different markets and trying to support different customers we've sort of like grown out a lot of functionality in a sometimes kind of ad hoc or haphazard way and so you know i've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we can kind of actively reduce the amount of complexity we have in the product um figure out how to like keep supporting those different use cases but we you know in a way that has like a simpler implementation um so that we can you know continue to build cool new stuff without you know being super bogged down by uh, what we've done before so give everyone that's listening a bit of a refresher on what exactly Tekton does. I know in 2020, especially when the community was first starting, it was hard to go a week without hearing someone talk about a feature store. And so there was a lot of questions about it because I think of that blog post that you were talking about, Matt, that had come out. And when Michelangelo was being examined by everyone else they realized okay there's something here when it comes to decoupling features from code and the yeah. models and all that so tecton has also evolved though it's not yeah. just a feature store i don't think now can you break down what what it does for us these days yeah so to to kind of tell the story a bit here it's interesting because like Back in 2020, I think if you were kind of in the like niche ML ops type of community, you were aware of what this was. But when I joined, I so I joke that like when I joined, I you know did everything except product management and then kind of just moonlighted as a PM on the side. And such is the nature of like a super small company. And so I was doing uh, early on like a bunch of our demos and sales calls, and there was a a fair number of them that would come in and be like. I have no idea what you guys do. I just heard that the Michelangelo guys were starting something. So like, tell me what it is. And so I'm like, okay, like, let me tell you about this product that you didn't even know existed in the first place in a category that you've never heard of. And so uh, I'd have to really uh, start from scratch in the early days of the feature store. It's a very different uh, world at this point. And so really the way that I pitched it was like, hey, you have all of this uh, raw data that you're trying to use to make automated decisions in your business, whether it's like 
detecting a fraudulent transaction or making recommendations or, you know, close to home use cases for me, like ranking someone's Twitter home feed. Um, and in order to uh, get that data to that model, it has to be turned into features and then it has to be delivered in two contexts, which is at training time, offline, people need to be able to get the values of the features as they were at any given training event. So like, hey, this credit card transaction, we determined it's fraudulent. At the time at which someone was making the transaction, what were their feature values? And that's a tricky problem to get right. Um, okay. But then also hard is uh, getting those same feature values to your model at inference time, um, all at low latency. And what makes this really hard is that like, it's kind of this place where data science and software engineering suddenly meet, which have traditionally been a bit of like different worlds. Like data science is, you know, very uh, scientific. It's very experimental in nature. It's kind of the wild yeah. west, pip install whatever you want and figure it out. That's totally fine. Uh, but the world of software engineering like had, you know, decades of best practices built up with DevOps and CICD and people thinking about like scaling and latency, et cetera. Uh, and it turned out that like, when you finally merged the two of those, it didn't go quite as well as everybody uh, had hoped. And so there was a lot of room there for people to like figure out the right technologies that were going to merge like data science into the software engineering realm. And so that's kind of like that like key part where the feature store comes in. And so we were building this out. But what was weird is like at the time we didn't know what it needed to be. Like it was almost like the people on the calls were like, we don't totally know what this is going to turn into. Like we're solving some problems. We're working with customers. Um, but as kind of time went on, we realized that like it really had to do with more than just kind of that online, offline storage and serving component, which was what it was kind of like evolving to mean canonically was like, oh, you know, you have an online store, you have an offline store, you serve values at training and inference time. But what we found when we talked to a bunch of customers who were just having problems is like they also had a ton of problems with actually like building and orchestrating and running the feature pipelines themselves. So like the, you know, streaming infrastructure to calculate these values in near real time um, or uh, the orchestration to backfill them. Or even we started to find customers that were like, all of my logic needs to be executed at request time and I need to be able to manage that. And so like there was a whole category of like, how do I build features and engineer them? There was the storage and serving component. Then obviously like monitoring became a natural kind of progression to this. Of like, okay, now I need to monitor for SKU and data quality. Uh, and then, you know, as we helped more and more big organizations, there's also like this huge collaboration component of like, hey, how do I share features that another team uses? How do I have like access yeah. controls on this whole system? And so I feel like for a while we kept trying to call it a feature store and internally we were like, this isn't like checking out anymore because then other people would say feature store and they meant something different. We're like, is it a feature store? Is it is it something else? And so uh, we finally bit the bullet a, a few years ago and we're like, all right, we're going to put a stake in the ground. It's a feature platform and the feature store is like the core storage and serving component, um, which there's you know several different solutions for. But really what we find is like the feature platform is the thing that ends up like really unlocking a lot of the like real time AI at, at these organizations. Yeah, because the feature store really just makes people think like, oh, that's like a glorified database. Yeah, right? it's just, <laughs> exactly. I can just do that in my database. Why don't? Why do I need a whole new product for that? But really what I'm hearing you say is there's a lot of other hard parts to this, whether it's orchestrating these features in their pipelines or it, it's monitoring that the, the features are actually doing yeah. what they're supposed to be doing or it's serving them at, very low latency, which I know was always something that became problematic when you wanted to get to, uh, yeah, real real time as somebody as some people call it. You know, like not just that uh, every five seconds real time, or like when you're talking about real time. I guess you guys know best. Like, what is real time to you? What does that even mean for you? You know. Yeah, and really, like, that's, it's funny you said, like, there's other hard parts, but it's almost like the hardest parts actually lie, you know, in the rest of the system, at least in in what I found. I sometimes say, even internally, like, the storage is almost an implementation detail. Like, it's, like, it's there so that we can cache values effectively and serve them faster. But, like, if I didn't need a, a intermediate storage layer, then I wouldn't use one. And even in the offline case, sometimes we actually don't, uh, which is interesting. But, like, really, the... 
you know, I'm a PM, I think, in jobs to be done. It's like you have some feature that you're trying to express. You're like, what's the user's, you know, average transaction total uh, in the last one year? And you have some requirements, like I need to know that value as of, to your point, like 10 milliseconds ago. And I need it served, you know, to my model that's, you know, running in my production environment. Like you just want to express here's semantically what the feature means. Here's what my requirements are. And then you want the system to worry about like, oh, okay, there's an orchestrator to figure, you know, to schedule these and to backfill them. And there's a storage layer that's going to help cache these. And, you know, there's a real time layer to finish computing them. But like, you don't want to worry about that stuff. You don't want to think in terms of like the components and the architecture. You're like, I'm just trying to express a thing and when and where I need it and how. And then the system takes care of kind of getting that all done. So I almost think like feature store is just like increasingly kind of like a misnomer. Like it feels very, like you said, like, it's indexing on a component or the underlying architecture instead of like the problem that is really what people have. Yeah. You don't want to worry about the architecture. Let the chief no. deal with <laughs> the that. The chief will figure it out for you. That's what we have him for. <laughs> oh, classic. And I know you all have been working hard to update things. And there was a big announcement, I feel like, that came out when I did the apply conference a few months back. But since you've also had newer announcements can you update me on what is like the newest stuff you've been doing yeah totally um yeah i'll kick it off here and mike can uh, can chime in so historically tecton has been a fairly spark centric platform and that kind of evolved as a consequence i think of the types of customers that we worked with like you know a lot of that like early adopter category it was made up of like these larger organizations that had super real-time requirements a lot of them ended up being like uh, spark shops and were very you know proficient in spark and so we indexed on spark as like a key technology to start um inside of tecton and then we started exploring like the data warehouse space and how we would integrate there and like quickly quickly started realizing a couple things like one when we went out and talked to a bunch of the market, like Spark only really works for maybe about half of them. Um, and it's kind of either just overkill or unfamiliar uh, for the other half. Um, but we also realized that like we didn't want to build like all these versions of Tecton that was going to be like there's, you know, Tecton on Spark and then there's going to be, you know, Tecton on Snowflake and, you know, which version of Tecton do you want to get? Um, and so we wanted to design something that was like, okay, what's like the one solution that's going to work for all of these organizations? And so something that we built and released recently that we were super excited about um, is a built-in compute engine to Tecton uh, that we call Rift. And it's entirely Python native, so you can run Python and Pandas transformations, whether you're building like a batch feature, a streaming feature, a real-time feature. Um, it's super performant. We can do like cost efficient aggregations over millions of events uh, in a very large time range, which is too, uh, typically super hard. Uh, it requires like no external infrastructure. So like you can literally hop into a hex notebook or a deep note notebook or even a local Jupyter notebook, pip install Tecton and do all of your feature development there uh, with Python as your only dependency there. Um, and then it plugs in the data warehouses too. So you can plug into your Snowflake It'll actually like push down compute to your warehouse to do like initial stages of transformations and then kind of follow that up with additional logic. Um, and what's cool is it dramatically simplifies for a lot of customers like what it takes to get started with a feature platform. It's a lot more in their wheelhouse. The iteration speed is like a lot faster for them. Like it just it's snappier when you don't need to start a Spark job on some attached cluster. Um, if you, you know, have a whole company designed around like making Spark uh, not a giant pain to manage, then like, you know, it can be all right. Or if you're like a Spark shop, right, and you're like, we're really deep in Spark and we know how to manage it, then great. But like, if those things aren't true, like you, you don't want to be diving into it unnecessarily. You're like, look, I'm a, you know, I'm a Python shop. I'm a data warehouse shop. Like, I just want to pip and install something and be off to the races. And so... uh that's what we've been working on. That's what uh, our chief here has been helping design out for us. Uh, and yeah, we finally launched it into a private preview in November, racing towards a public preview. Already got a few customers uh, on board and, and go into production, and we're super excited. And there's one thing I want to say before Mason jumps in, which is he mentioned before, I feel like it was the understatement of the year of 
when data scientists had to do software engineering stuff or even data engineering stuff back in the day, that is a recipe for disaster almost, uh, ten, nine times out of 10. And what you're talking about here, if I'm understanding it correctly, is you're saying, look, we know it can be painful to use Spark if you're not used to using Spark. So we yeah. want to just get that out of the way and we want to come to where you are instead of you having to come to where we are. Yep, that, yep. that's exactly right. And to add to that, it I think it wasn't even just a matter of like people not having prior experience with Spark. We were also kind of asking them to use Spark for use cases that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so in a lot of cases, you know, some of our, you know, some of our customers would be dealing, dealing with data sets that were like a few tens of gigabytes. Um, and we were, you know, spinning up these giant Spark clusters um, in order for them to process those data sets. Uh, it just didn't make a whole lot of sense and it wasn't worth the extra complexity um, that Spark comes with. So one of the big design principles of like this new uh, piece of the product we have is just like kind of choosing the appropriate tool for the job and, and not going overboard. So I'm very close to Amsterdam. I live right outside of Frankfurt and Amsterdam's like four hours away. And I noticed that there was going to be DuckDBCon and I was looking at who was speaking and I feel like somebody's name on here <laughs> on this call popped up. Uh, was it you? What is it true? Is it the same person? It's that's yeah, it's the same person. Even though it says chief architect instead of chief, that's that's still yeah. yeah. That is we'll, you. We'll get that fixed. <laughs> and so is that what's going on under the hood? Are you running DuckDB, and is that how you're able to do things still fast, but not having to be reliant on Spark? Yeah, that's a big piece of it. So um, part of what Tekton provides is sort of uh, this kind of built-in uh, library of queries um, that we kind of combine with the user query um, in order to prepare you know, their feature data uh, to be materialized for online or offline serving. Um, so we've used DuckDB for all of that. Um, and uh, it's been a really great experience so far. We've, we've really enjoyed using it. It was really quick to get going and we've been uh, impressed with the results that it can get with limited resources. So yeah, I'm, I, I am gonna be uh, giving a talk about that at DuckCon. Um, the, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting more users of the library. I mean, it's been really great so far. Are you gonna be in Amsterdam? Yeah, coming to Amsterdam for that. All right, looks like my choice has been made. I wasn't sure if I was going to go, but if you're going to be there, I guess I have to go now and I'll awesome. be able to say hi in person. That's super cool. So tell me more about what's going on under the hood with Rift. Yeah, so like I mentioned, uh, part of it is DuckDB. And then we, I, I would say really the, the most underlying piece of everything is that uh, we sort of shifted everything so that it was all the, everything is built around Arrow. Um, and the reason we chose to do it this way is because we had part of the design goal was that uh, we really wanted to be able to easily integrate with a bunch of different wa warehouses and, uh, you know, different data engineering libraries like uh, Pandas or Polars or even DuckDB if, um, you know, our customers end up wanting to do their feature engineering in SQL. Um, so we've built this thing out in sort of a modular way where we use arrow, uh, to exchange data between the different stages. Um, and so, you know, a typical, you know, query would look like, uh, maybe the customer sets up a data source, which is, um, a snowflake table, uh, and then they give us a transformation that they want to run in order to produce, uh, feature data from that table. And then they want to, um, you know, serve those features. Uh, through our online serving infrastructure. So what we would do is we would first run the query in Snowflake, uh, potentially applying, you know, filters or projections in the Snowflake query based on what the users asked us for, if they're, you know, only interested in a subset of the data or something like that. That gets streamed back to our job. Um, and then we pass that as like an arrow data set um, into DuckDB, where we can do, you know, aggregations on it, depending on what the user's configured. And then that gets pass out of DuckDB as another data set, and then that's where we upload it to our online database. Um, and then later, when, you know, later on when they come to query that, then we can uh, serve it out of that online database with like reliable low latency. Sure. Um, 
So that's kind of like the batch workflow. We also have um, a separate uh, interface where people, you know, have like a stream of data that they want to um, create features from. We have like an HTTP interface where they can just send us a row of data at the time, at a time, and we can apply similar oh, nice. types of transformations to what I was just describing for the batch workflow. And so I know that when I've looked at other engineering blogs, a lot of times you'll see like the Kafka Flink kind of pair come up. And I imagine that you guys thought long and hard about the architecture of this and the design. What are some design decisions that you were a little bit skeptical of making, but now that you've done it and you've seen the fruits of the labor, you are like, oh, I am going to do this nine times out of 10 next uh, for the next whatever hundred times that I do this, right? Yeah, I think, you know, one big one is that rather than, um, you know, using kind of a purpose-built stream processing engine like Flink, um, we've gone for this kind of simplified approach um, where, you know, our stream ingestion, it's actually just stateless. So, you know, in contrast to Flink, where it has to, you know, depending on what types of aggregations you're trying to do, you have to, you know, potentially maintain these very large query states, which can lead to a lot of operational issues. Hey, this is Mike Del Balso, co-founder and CEO of Tecton. Uh, MLOps community is the best way to stay in the loop on the latest MLOps news and best practices. It's also a great way to connect with experts and get support from an amazingly helpful community. Subscribe and stay in the loop. Um, the ingestion time, we all of our processing is totally stateless. So you can filter things out or you can do projections, but no like aggregations at materialization time. Um, and then what we do is we just actually do the aggregation at serving time. Um, and so that the benefit of that is that like the it's it's very simple. There are like a lot fewer things to go wrong. You can't run out of disk space to hold your streaming checkpoints. You don't have to worry about um, you know, the latency of the stream query, like committing a checkpoint, um, it, basically the critical path from like data going in to being available, um, at serving time is, is just dead simple. Um, and I think that served us super well and it's made it, you know, not just possible, but actually like relatively easy for us to, you know, operate this managed service in a way that's like, uh, meets our customers reliability, uh, reliability goals, um, which are pretty high. I mean, we, you know, we have customers that are using this for things like, um, you know, uh, fraud detection for, um, you know, credit card transactions and things like that, you know, uh, use cases where they want it to be, you know, online nearly all of the time. Um, so that was a super important design goal for us. Um, the downside of that, of course, is that like, if you get super large aggregations, it can, it can start causing performance issues. Um, mm. and so we're currently actually working on um, a project to kind of do those, uh, what we call compaction. So if you're aggregating over a large time series, we don't uh, do, you know, do the, the aggregation at materialization time, but we'll sort of ingest the data later on, we'll come back and do the aggregation and replace it in the database. And so you can kind of get the best of both worlds that way. You talk about how if you have larger uh, aggregations, what, I guess, what is large in your eyes? Define large and what that looks like. And I don't want to be the guy that says, because I know in every talk that has ever been given at a conference, you always have one person that will raise their hand and be like, so, uh, how does this scale? And I don't want to be that guy yeah. right now, but I'm going to yeah. be that guy. <laughs> what is large and what is not large? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the typical like engineering answer to this question is always, it depends. Um, and it does, uh, depend <laughs> in this case. Um, I mean, in terms of, I, so there's a couple different issues where you, you might imagine there would be, you know, or a couple different dimensions where you, you might have trouble scaling. Uh, one is like the amount of data that has to be aggregated for a single feature. Um, I think with our current architecture without the compaction, um, we're, doing pretty well uh, aggregating a single series of maybe a few tens of thousands of data points, um, potentially even into the like low hundreds of thousands. 
Um, oh, past well. that, it can start to be um, a bit of an issue. I mean, of course, it depends on the latency budget that that particular use case has. Um, so, you know, a hundred thousand is like plenty for a lot of use cases, but for, you know, use cases where people have more than that, we're working on this compaction feature to address that. Um, and then another dimension, uh, you know, that you might be concerned about is like the total size of the data set that you're trying to transform into feature data, um, for materialization, kind of like in the, the batch use case, um, and it's a little bit early days for us with this. Like we had, you know, we're still in private and preview. We haven't done, uh, we don't have like a whole lot of experience, but um, what we found so far is that uh, DuckDB actually does, uh, DuckDB and Arrow do surprisingly well with large data sets. Um, they are much more memory efficient uh, than like pandas would be, for instance. So I think a lot of people probably have, you know, the experience of like trying to load up like a five gigabyte data set in the pandas and then they find out like it's actually exceeded um you know the 32 gigabytes of memory they have on their laptop um arrow and duckdb are both more efficient about the memory they use and then they also have ways of processing larger than memory data sets where you kind of just go through a chunk at a time um and so the combination of those means that um you know we're we're able to handle pretty large data sets like better than what you might think if you're used mostly to pandas. We also make it like pretty easy for people like vertically scale. So, you know, at materialization time, it's, you know, choose an EC2 instance that you want. You can scale it up really big. It can process a fair amount there. And I we find it works for honestly the majority of use cases. I don't know if you saw D, there was a really good blog post from I want to say he was a product manager of BigQuery. It was called like Big Data is Dead that came out somewhat recently, basically arguing that like you know, big data has been the whole wave and that's where everything's going, et cetera. But really it's like, you know, a very small percentage of companies that have truly large data and instead the vast majority of people, even, you know, on a large single node instance can actually process most of what they need to. And there's other like clever ways of being able to, to optimize this, like Mike's been talking about and, you know, we spit up, split up backfill ranges, uh, uh, intelligently. We, you know, do optimizations like he's talking about with compaction to make things simpler along the way. Uh, and so I think what we find is like, it actually turns out for the vast majority of use cases, you can get super far uh, scaling up on a single node. And so it's not worth like all of the additional complexity that needs to be introduced by like large scale distributed processing. Yeah. yeah I think if you go and look at that blog post, he kind of identifies uh, one terabyte as sort of like the maximum size um, of like a data warehouse that you would expect to find in most companies. And if you look, you can actually, from Amazon, you can buy EC2 instances that have 24 terabytes of memory in them now. So um, the the size, you know, limit for vertical scaling these days is pretty large compared to what uh, lots of people actually have in their data warehouses. Yeah, I actually, I think that was the... Speaking about DuckDB, that was the creator of Mother Duck, like the managed That's right. DuckDB. He he went from BigQuery and he he started to do Mother Duck, and he was talking about that how because we just had him on recently, like whatever a month ago oh, to cool. this podcast, and he was mentioning how it felt like for a while if you weren't over engineering things for all this big data then were you actually an engineer, you know? <laughs> and so it was almost like you were getting peer pressured into doing more engineering than you needed to because you were expecting to get this influx of data or you were expecting to be working with gigantic amounts of data. And then when push comes to shove, the data scientists and the people that are actually using and consuming this data, maybe they don't even want that much of the data they just want like the last week's worth of data because of the freshness constraints that they have yeah i personally i'm super happy that that blog post is around and it's getting a lot of traction because i think like you know it's uh kind of one thing to be able to look at the performance of these systems and come to the conclusion yourself like well this will be adequate for what our customers need but like you also have to be able to uh convince people that it will actually be adequate and so the fact that there's sort of this growing consensus around um, kind of simpler single node systems 
um, you know, led by people like uh, Mother Duck, I think has been super helpful for this, uh, you know, this new product to be successful for us. That's so true. Yeah, I think really, I think combining that with this kind of stream architecture that Mike talked about has been like the biggest factor in us simplifying the product. And it, it's kind of a similar thing of like, you could easily over-engineer the problem and be like, yeah, we're going to, you know, run a Flink cluster under the hood and you're going to worry about, you know, managing and provisioning streaming infrastructure, et cetera. And like, it turns out that like the majority of what people need is like a dozen or so aggregations. And really what they want is like, they want a uh, very limited operational overhead. They want to be able to just use like Python and Pandas to run transformations. And then they need it to be performant to their like latency or scale, which generally means like, Hey, I have a hundred millisecond budget to be able to get features back, but I need to be able to have an aggregation that spans like, you know, the entire lifetime of an account maybe. And so indexing much more on like, we'll just make that as simple as humanly possible, I think has been, uh, kind of, you know, retrospectively looking at it, one of the, the better design decisions along the way. That's, I, I think kind of the mixture of that with Rift, with kind of, you know, simplifying the like away from the large scale distributed uh, processing when it's not needed. Like that's been dramatically helping us lower the complexity of the product. And Matt, you know how every engineering blog post, when you talk about creating some kind of a product, there's like, here's our fundamental principles or the guiding lights that we were looking at and our constraints and that kind of thing. Did you have principles as you were putting this together and you were going through the product creation phase? Yeah, definitely. Um, one was the the simplicity in getting started. Like I said, like it can't it can't take more than a pip and salt tecton for a data scientist or an ML engineer to start to be productive with this. If suddenly you're like, ah, oh, no, you're going to need to like have some sort of Spark provider external compute that we plug into, and you're going to need to know how to use XYZ in order to do this. Like that immediately would be kind of a no-go. That's um, like, how are us. your YAML skills? And... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Like it needed to be like, look, if, if you know Python, like we're, we're good to go, you know, you can start using the product. Um, so that was one for sure. Um, like testing and iteration speed is another thing that we really wanted to, to optimize for. So kind of in that same vein, like you should be able to work in whatever environment makes sense to you. And that goes to like the principal Mike was talking about, like, let's meet people where they are and let them choose the right tool that makes sense for them. As opposed to saying like, oh, you know, I know that you work in deep note or hex, but now you're going to need to learn how to use, you know, Databricks notebooks as your core development environment. And you're going to have to use Spark, et cetera. It's like, Hey, if you work in Hex and you like to use Pandas, sick. If you guys are a uh, data warehouse diehard shop and you want to be using Snowflake SQL for all of your feature engineering, that's awesome too. Like we can make that work. And so like meeting people where they are and working inside of their environment and simplifying that testing and iteration loop, that was also like a big element of, I think what we were trying to go for as we, we built out this solution. And then, like I said, kind of in that same vein, like, we really wanted this to just be like one product. Like we didn't want to have all these different versions of Tecton built on different underlying compute technologies. And so we needed to find something that was like modular and flexible enough that whether you're using Spark or Pandas or Snowflake SQL or whatever else, like that fits nicely into the platform. And that kind of goes to some of like the architectural decisions that Mike was talking about of like standardizing on the arrow format, et cetera, and also allowing us to evolve because you know, today it might be data warehouses or everyone's in on pandas, but like you, the industry is going to keep evolving. This isn't going to be like the last time that customers come to us and like want something else uh, baked into their feature platform to be made really simple and to fit with the tools that they're using. And so we wanted it to be able to kind of to kind of grow with that. And so I think that's where we hit like a good best of all worlds. And you know, we talk about a lot of this in contrast to Spark, but actually how we designed the system was like we wanted them to both kind of uh, live harmoniously under one roof. So like we still have a lot of customers that for very good reason use Spark. Like we have customers that are generating, you know, 90 terabyte training data sets. And what's interesting is that like, even within an organization, like there's teams that use Spark and then there's teams that don't. And there's teams that oh. use a data warehouse and then like there's teams that don't. And so it's not even just like, oh, some customers will use one or the other, but it's like in a single organization, you might have like 
different data scientists or ML engineers choosing different technologies. And we want all of those to like work together to go into a training data set. If you need to scale up and use Spark, then cool. If you don't, then like use Rift. And so we designed it all to just like live really nicely under one roof out the get go. So it's one product and under that product, you just reach for the tool that you need and they all work together. And that's what really like lets your data science team collaborate effectively together. Yeah, to, to add to that, I would say that like, kind of ironically, I think the existence of the Spark version of the product really enabled us to make a lot of product decisions to simplify Rift because it was always an option to say like, you know, if, you know, we can, there's a trade-off here where we can make the product easier to use, but maybe like somewhat limit the maximum scale that it can get to in this circumstance or that circumstance. Um, and by having Spark available, it made it a lot easier for us to say, okay, if someone hits that, they can, there's this kind of escape hatch to go to Spark. Um, and so we can kind of focus more on the like 90 or 95% use cases without worrying about the last 5%. I love that because I, in my mind, it seems like a lot of times there's the battle between simplicity and flexibility. And it almost is like you were able to get the best of both worlds there and say, we're going to go for simplicity, but we're also going to make it very flexible. And if you hit that certain scale, then we can bring in the big guns and we can go and yeah. get even more firepower behind you. Something we talk about internally, uh, you know, uh, Kevin, our CTO and head of product, uh, him and I talk about this a lot though, like. I think as a product, it's really important to make like the simple things simple, but the hard things possible. And so if what you're doing is like, you know, working with small to medium sized data sets, then it should not be hard at all for you to get started and to uh, be able to, you know, engineer your features, scale up uh, appropriately, et cetera. And, but if you're really going to the most extremes where, like I said, we have some of our customers there, like that's got to be doable. And like, there might be incremental complexity that you accept as you do that necessarily, but like that complexity can't then like spoil the easy cases in your product journey. And so I think part of that is like giving that optionality and knowing that like, you know, you can kind of progress with people through that complexity by allowing them to like choose the tool that makes sense and like voluntarily take on that complexity as their use case requires it. So <laughs> you ready for the part of the show? This is a new segment that <laughs> I'm going to call is he serious right now? And, uh, or even better, I'm going to call it, is this guy on drugs? And the questions <laughs> that I am going to ask you now <laughs> may seem like they come from an, a drug induced stupor, but I've heard murmurs, and I want to know if you all have been encountering this out in the wild because it's your day in, day out. One of these questions comes from features and looking at features and seeing that in the data world, features could, maybe they're not that far removed from what data analysts use as KPIs. Have you ever seen features and KPIs being shared or used in almost like the same way? What does that look like? Explain that. Um, I was expecting an even crazier question, so uh, oh, I'm, I'm fully just wait prepared. wait the next one. <laughs> uh, yes, definitely. We see some kind of cross-pollinating in that world. And so this kind of comes in... in two different forms. One, sometimes we'll see like, hey, I want my data analyst to be able to like create features or I want like the stuff that they've already created to be able to be used as features. Um, and then the other way is like, hey, I've created all of these features inside of my feature store, but like these could be really important business metrics for us. How do I get that like, you know, back available inside of my analytics systems? And so uh, something we've done for the latter um, that we published recently is actually the ability to like take any of your offline feature store data and publish it back into your warehouse. And so uh, it shows up just like as standard, you know, snowflake tables, for example, you can find all of your features there. And Tekton takes care of all of the, you know, orchestration and publishing of all of that feature data. And so that's one way that we kind of like get the features back in the analytical world so that they're available in both systems. And then analysts using, uh, 
using a feature platform that one's interesting like one that's important is like or like one element that's important is definitely allowing them to engineer with things like snowflake sql and what they're uh, familiar with um, but i think there's also room for feature platforms like lower the barrier of entry and make it even easier to work inside of the platform etc some things that we do is make it really easy to take an existing snowflake table and just be like this is my features um, so we can get those really uh in really easily like that but i would say like it's it's in the realm of like things that we think about and things that we get asked about quite a lot. I do think that there's like uh, there's good overlap in that you want like features and business metrics available in both systems. But I think that there's also enough divergence that like you don't want it to be the exact same system. Like there's a there's a good reason why like analytics teams have their tools and data science and data engineering teams have their tools. Like they hit on different requirements and different. Uh, kind of like interfaces that those teams are familiar with. And so I don't think you actually want them to like converge to one tool. I just think that you need that data to be really easily shared between them. Yeah, it's like one hop away as opposed to being the same thing. Yeah. So uh, I got to think of a better name for this. This one is going to be the part of the show. This is the segment that we call, Can You Get Any More Hypey? And uh, you know it was coming. But how are people, how are you seeing people use LLMs when it comes to feature stores? And are they creating features with LLMs? I know there is actually one guy, uh, Sumat, I think that I follow on LinkedIn, who's always talking about LLMs and recommender systems. And so it feels like there's a lot of potential there. But again, you're in the wild day in, day out. Is anyone actually doing stuff in production with this? That's a, so a good question. Uh, definitely saw that one coming because I think if you're in the data space at all, uh, you're, you're getting hounded with this uh, regardless of what what team you're on or organization. Um, so yeah, for a while, like, you know, we ourselves had to figure out like, what does the story actually look like? Like, where do feature platforms fit into this space? Um, you know, do we use LLMs to be like creating features? Like maybe people are like giving human readable descriptions of features and we're then like in, in the same vein as what I talked about before, like we worry about all the data engineering under the hood and you worry about just like telling us what your feature is. Um, so we explored that path a bit. Um, and I do think there's actually some like real, real fruit there. That's like English to feature basically instead of like, to, or text to feature. Yeah, pretty wow. much because like we, we have a giant repository of, uh, you know, feature definitions and associated descriptions and things like that. Like it's not unreasonable that you could go from a human readable description of a, a feature to all the, you know, data engineering pipelines needed to make it happen. Um, but I think the most interesting thing for me of how they fit together is like, if you like zoom out and you kind of look at what these systems are doing, right? And like, you know, traditional predictive ML, you have uh, data that is getting turned into like relevant information that then goes into some model, which is making a prediction, which is then being used to like affect the application in some way. And as we kind of integrate LLMs into software applications, it's kind of fundamentally the same thing. Like you have relevant information, that relevant information needs to be turned into a format that's re that can be digested by an LLM. You take that, you put it into an LLM, it gives you back some, you know, results, uh, you know, in most cases in traditional ML, it's like some prediction here, it might be like some generative text, and then that goes into your application and changes the behavior. And so, like, there's a ton of parallels. It's like the LLM systems, and I'm sure you've talked all about like the, the RAG design with like um, retrieval augmented generation. So like, you have some data instead of turning it into features, like you're turning it into embeddings and turn it, instead of loading it into a key value store, you're loading it into some vector database um, instead of, you know, writing some rule on some like prediction that you get back. You're like taking back all of that text and you're like inserting it back into your application to show to a user. And so like a lot of the like core components of this are all the same. Like at the end of the day, you have data, that's information. It needs to go in a model. The results of that model need to go back into your application. And so I think there's a ton of overlap in like the fundamental problems of how do you productionize this? How do you integrate it into an application? How do you get that relevant information? Like think like feature stores getting features for a model. It's really not that different to like get relevant business data to an LLM so that if you say like, 
you know, if you're a travel website and the person's like, hey, I need to figure out where I'm going to go next summer. It's like you want that LLM to have relevant information about that person, what they've been doing, like where they've been before. And like, that's honestly the same role that feature stores play today. I think they'll play that same role in kind of these rag systems and getting that uh, information there. Uh, and then I think also there's another interesting part that I've been looking at where we do a lot of like these real time uh, feature pipelines where like, you know, at request time, someone might need to like run some logic to compare an existing transaction amount to a historical one. And I actually think there's some really cool things we can do right in that space with like kind of like managed prompts where like you're storing your prompts as code, but then at retrieval time, you're kind of hydrating in relevant information from your feature platform. So you're like, oh, like tell me all this useful information about the user, then take those values, inject them into these prompts, then take that prompt and call out to an LLM, then get that LLM response, parse it, send it back. And so you then just have one API where you're like, you know, I'm putting in some like user query here and the feature platform is taking care of all of that. And where you used to have like hard-coded features, you might actually have like dynamic like prompts that you're then feeding into LLMs. Uh, I like that. Yeah, I've definitely seen that as far as a pattern goes with prompts. You need to give that context. Like the more context you can give the prompt, the more that you're going to get a, a valid answer or a useful answer, right? And so if you can give context yep. around how many times did this person look at this flight in the past 24 or 48 hours or where else have they traveled to and they've given these stars on Google, all of that context is going to be really useful. And that is features right there. Like everything that I just said, those exactly. are all features, <laughs> right? So I, and it's really the same thing. Like you're taking that data, you're putting it in a model, you're taking those results, you're doing something with it. Like it, it was almost funny like looking back that you're like, oh, that's actually so obvious. If you look at the system at first, you're like, oh, how do these fit together? And you're like, wait, it's like kind of the same thing with that we're doing. Like, you know, maybe the individual components are now a little bit different along the way, but yeah, like yeah. there's no fundamental difference in taking data, giving it to a model, taking the results and changing the behavior of your application. Incredible. Well, fellas, I guess I've got one last question for you before we go. If I'm out there and I'm thinking about what you're going to be doing next, where what's on the roadmap and where, what do you want to sink your teeth into? Uh, I guess <laughs> as a, a PM, I can kick this off. So certainly a lot of this LLM stuff um, that we're talking about here, we're you know, actively making investments into this area. Um, so stay tuned with more to come. Um, that's definitely a big area for us. Um, I think continuing to make this Rift product successful and lower the barrier to entry. Like I think, you know, we're still in the early days of a feature platform. There's a lot of people out there that are trying to figure out how to infuse their products with real-time decisioning, whether it's with an LLM or whether it's with, uh, you know, traditional predictive ML uh, types of applications. Uh, and I think we want to make it really easy, uh, make it possible. Uh, allow these teams to make their applications way smarter and Rift is going to be a big part of us doing that um, and then I think it'll be a, a lot of fun for us to expand beyond just managing features to managing really those entire real-time decisioning pipelines everything from like submitting prompts to LLMs to running multi-stage uh, ranking for recommendation systems I think that's where Tecton is going to continue to go in the future curious Mike if you have any thoughts around this yeah um i mean definitely i have a lot of focus on rift right now i mean that's you know kind of one thing to be developing uh something you know within the company and but you know of course when you get users onto it they find all sorts of things you might never have thought of that break um so you know focusing a lot on making sure that uh you know we make that successful um another one i'm excited about and rift is part of this but we also have um some other things in the works is like making it easier for people to actually try out tecton so historically it's you know we've had a fairly involved like people have to you know talk to sales folks in order to get the hand their hands on the product um and uh we're we're focusing on making it a little bit easier for people to kind of test drive things um so i'm i'm excited for that in the next year yeah it feels like riff lends itself nicely to that. Just the pip install Tecton is a much different story than. Yeah. So talk to me about your Spark cluster. 
development. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How about you, uh, Demetrius? What are you excited about in the next year? Oof, man. What am I excited about? The main things that I think my focus are on right now are virtual conferences and having awesome experiences, as you all know, whether that is Tecton Apply that we're going to be doing pretty soon here, um, uh, or it's the AI in production conference that I'm putting together, or it is uh, any other slew of conferences that I can con people into letting me be a part of. <laughs> that is uh, what I'm excited about. But then I'm thinking about doing an in-person conference. It's just a little bit scary because uh, I could totally go bankrupt if I do it wrong, you know? <laughs> like that's the big part on it. Uh, it's not like a virtual conference where, all right, nobody shows up, no big deal. If nobody shows up, I've got a whole warehouse rented or whatever. And, and I do want to do it differently. If I do a conference, I don't want to do a conference. I want to do like a uh, hullabaloo or something like that. I want to do an actual festival type vibe as opposed to a conference type vibe. So people in costumes and all that stuff. Uh, but so that, the Coachella that's, of, of data conferences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of it. It's just, yeah, it's really like, I gotta, I gotta work up the courage for that one. So we'll see if in Q3 or Q4 that actually happens, that materializes or not. Uh, and in the meantime, the other thing, like my main focus is the virtual conference, but the other thing that I've been focusing on that has been an absolute blast because I learned a ton about what people are doing in the wild is the surveys that we do. So we do surveys and then I kind of rack my head against the wall or I hit my head against the wall for a few months, try and gather data and understand the data and really parse it out. And then I write a report on it. So that's something new that I did last year with the LLMs in production survey and report that came off the back of it. And we're doing it with the evaluation survey right now. So how people are evaluating their systems. And so there's, it's like, it's a painful process, but it is exciting because I learn. And those are the two things that I've got on my mind. That's cool. If you, uh, if you pull the trigger on your conference festival, send me an invite. I'll be there. There we go. I'll, br I'll bring the chief. Only if you come in costume. Yeah, chief, you got to come with a headdress and all of that. <laughs> I'm expecting big costume from you. That might be seen as, it might not be politically correct. It might be culturally <laughs> yeah. appropriating. It's going to shit. We so, have to think about that one a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out a different costume. It's all right. Well, so like, Guys, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you coming on here and getting to chat with you again. And of course, like uh, hopefully when we meet in person again, we will get to make some music because I have fond memories of the last time that we were hanging out in person, making music. People probably don't yeah. know this that are listening, but Matt is an expert drummer and you give him a tabletop, <laughs> he'll make it into a drum even. So uh, pairing that with my poor guitar skills is a recipe for disaster, but that doesn't mean we don't do it. You are underselling yourself. Uh, I think some good jam sessions are for sure in our future. Excellent. Well, fellas, I'll talk to you later. This was awesome. Good All catch right. it up, Dean. Yeah, thanks for having us. You have to immerse yourself in the ML Ops content. The best way to do it is to subscribe to the ML Ops Community Podcast. So, good luck and keep learning.